God's green earth, thank you very much for your ongoing interest in the words of truth, the words of life. When Jesus was tempted in Matthew uh, 4 and in Luke chapter 4, the very first temptation turning stones into bread, Jesus told Satan, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, finish the verse, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that's how Jesus lived. So in saying that, he's telling us, we must live the way he lived his earthly life. Let me say it again, but I'll say it differently. There is a tendency among us to view the earthly life of Christ as above what is required of us. The earthly life of Christ is the very life you and I must live. And as he lived it through the Father, we must live it through him. Are you following me? Let's not lower God's standards. Let's ask for grace to come up to the standard. The purpose of the gospel is not to lower the claims of God's law. The purpose of the gospel is to lift us up to that level. All right. Is there anyone present tonight for the very first time? May I see your hand? First time. Anyone? First time. First time. <laughs> okay. We have an angel who has no wings right over here. <laughs> God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. Come back tomorrow night. We'll be happy to see you. Maybe there's someone online joining us for the first time. If that is the case, thank you so much. And may the Lord bless you. I want to answer a question, which is an excellent one. It sprung out or sprang out of the message I did on the Gospel of John, which had seven miracles. Remember that subject? And the first miracle was changing water into wine. But let me pray for wisdom before I attempt to answer. Father in heaven, as I answer this question, speak through me that greater light may shine from your word, that you may be glorified and we may be lifted up. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There were two questions. I'll combine them. One question was, is it okay to drink a little wine? The second question was, when Jesus turned water into wine, did he turn it into alcohol or into grape juice? To answer that question, let's take a look at the use of wine when it first appears in the Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 9, and I hope I can do this quickly and get to my message for tonight. Genesis 9, we'll read from verse 20. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. Now read the next verse for me. What does that say? And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. This is not grape juice. Are you following me? This is alcohol. He was in a stupor. He was in an alcoholic coma. That's the negative wine. Because wine is just wine in the Bible, wine, wine, wine. Which one is good, which is bad? Let's look at the, the third reference to wine. Let us go to Genesis 19. We'll read from verse 20, uh, verse 30, sorry. Genesis 19, reading from verse 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain, and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar. And so he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. In other words, wine was used again to get a man drunk to commit whatever that crime was when a daughter sleeps with her father. So wine in Genesis 9, negative, that's alcoholic. Wine, Genesis 90, negative, that's alcoholic. Let's go to chapter 14 and look at the first good use of wine in the Bible. Genesis 14. Yes, 1-4. Genesis 14. 
we'll read verse 18 of Genesis 14. Do you have that? And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath given thine enemies into thy hands. And he gave him tithes of all. Now Melchizedek is, a symbolic, uh, is symbolic of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. You read that throughout the book of uh, Hebrews. The priesthood of Melchizedek symbolizes the priesthood of Christ because we have no information about the father and mother, the genealogy of Melchizedek. Now, we know he had one because he was a real person. But his priesthood is used to symbolize the priesthood of Christ who had no father, no mother, no beginning. Now, where God is involved, where Christ is involved, we cannot assume that Christ promotes the use of alcohol. Here's what the Spirit of Christ told Solomon to write. Go to Proverbs chapter 20. Remember now, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 11 tells us, the Old Testament prophets wrote under the direction of the Spirit of Christ. 1 Peter 1 11, under the direction of the Spirit of Christ. Here's what the Spirit of Christ told uh, Solomon to write in Proverbs chapter 20 verse 1. Are you there? Not yet. Proverbs 20 verse 1 is already 16 after 6. Have you found it? Yeah. Read with me. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Now look at wine and strong drink keep company one with the other because both are strong drink. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The consumption of alcoholic beverages is a form of deception. You are deceiving yourself into thinking you are getting biological benefits. Now, from time to time, you read or you listen to the news that a glass of wine a day uh, reduces heart attacks and two glasses a day lengthens your life. We don't, do you know that a study was done in 2008 at Johns Hopkins University, a university, a medical school that always ranks in the top 10 year after year? The results of the study were, the result or the result was, that one glass of alcohol a week shrinks the size of the brain. Two drinks a day shrinks the brain even smaller. They studied the brains of drinkers and non-drinkers and realized that drinkers of alcohol have a smaller brain than those who do not drink. Now, I'm no scientist. I'm just telling you what I read. Alcohol it has a damaging effect on the body, even in small amounts. No amount of alcohol makes you a better driver. No amount of alcohol makes you a better pilot. And I fly all the time. Are you following me? Pilots have been arrested and taken off planes because alcohol was detected on their breath. Because the, the authorities know that their thinking, the cognition, and the skills can be impaired to some degree, even by a small amount of alcohol. And so the Bible says, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If any man destroy this temple, him shall God destroy. Let's look at wine again. Go to Daniel chapter 1. Let's read verse 5 and verse 8, or verses 5 and 8 of Daniel 1. We answer the question, did Jesus turn water into alcoholic wine? The obvious answer is no. God will not give that to his people, not even to his enemies. Daniel 1 verse 5, and the king provided them a daily portion of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king, meaning the Hebrew boys that Nebuchadnezzar had selected to train for three years. He chose their diet, part of the diet was wine. Let's read verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Now clearly, wine defiles according to that verse. But that's not grape juice. That's alcoholic. Now Jesus who made the body, Jesus who told us, if anyone destroys this body, that person I'll destroy, cannot change water into alcohol and give it to people because he had Solomon right. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. He had Solomon right. In Proverbs 23, verse 31, Look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it uh, turneth itself aright, 
in the end it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder that's alcohol not grape juice what Christ turned the water into was clearly blaze a uh, grape juice not alcohol when Paul told Timothy use a little wine for your stomach's sake we must not automatically assume he's uh, suggesting alcohol because then people begin to argue how much is a little a little for me maybe this a little for you maybe that you understand that the Bible will not put us in that position avoid alcohol at all costs whatever so-called benefits it may have avoiding it brings even better benefits all right so no drinking among people in Hammond who attend this church are you following me our subject for this evening what is sound doctrine what is sound doctrine of course I always ask you please turn these off mine is off so we preserve reverence in the house of God favor number two while I'm speaking pray for me and say Lord put your words in that man's mouth Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and the Lord said unto me behold I have put my words in thy mouth those are the words I want to speak and favor number three you tell me what that is come on think Isaiah 118 come now let us reason together when you don't answer me I get the impression you're sleeping with your eyes open so when I ask you a question you must answer me I'll feel much better and I know you and I are in touch with one another but if you just sit and look at me I'll wonder what you're looking at okay <laughs> let's bow our heads and pray father I am honored delighted and privileged to fellowship with your people here at the Hammond SDA Church and their guests and with those online thank you for this great honor day God as you give me help I will do all I can to deliver the message simply clearly without any intrusion of my opinions if we have sinned against you particularly me forgive us father cleanse us because the presence of sin interferes with the comprehension of truth dear God give me simple language fill my heart with the humility of Christ and my mind with the spirit of truth bless everyone listening in person and online bless every country represented by those watching particularly our host country of the United States father let this message be a blessing to someone pour out a special blessing on all our guests who are joining us and a sweet blessing on all the young boys and girls who are watching I offer this prayer from my heart along with the request that you place your healing hand on the sick in Jesus name let God's people say amen and amen let's go to first Timothy chapter 1 are you there let's read from verse 3 what does that say as I besought thee to do what abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that I might charge some that they do what teach no other doctrine neither give heed to what fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do now Paul says I have left you make sure that people do not teach any other doctrine so you see the word doctrine in that verse 3 of I believe it's 3 of 1st Timothy 1 Paul wants Timothy to make sure he teaches and he encouraged those under his ecclesiastical authority to preach sound doctrine what's our subject what is sound did I give you the topic what is sound doctrine now let's go to verse 8 of first Timothy chapter 1 are you at 8 read with me what does that say but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully now the law can be misused some people erroneously try to use the law as an instrument of salvation that's not the function of the law Jesus Christ is the instrument of salvation but when he saves you he saves you to a law abiding life is that clear no it's not clear let me try it again here's the law of God thou shalt not thou shalt not here's Jesus I look at the law I can't do that are you following me I can't do that I look to Jesus 
Jesus now does something to me, changes me, covers me with a life that is consistent with his law. So now the law looks at me and says, that life I can approve. Are you following me? The law looks at me, at that life I can approve. Mm. So when Jesus covers you and me, it has to be witnessed by the law. Are you following me? That life is a law-abiding life. The law does not save you. The law witnesses to the correctness of your life and the fact that you're truly saved. By the way, the only definite proof of genuine conversion is obedience to God's law. Now, let's read verse 8 again. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Now, you have to read with me now. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Now, we have a long list from 9 to 10. But for the lawless and disobedient, for the un godly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of, of mothers, for manslayers. Next verse. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for, what's the next one? Men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. Stop. The law was made for them. I want you to stop and think of that. Let me ask you this. When you see the police, do you panic? Why? Because you live a law-abiding life. And when you see the police, you feel comfortable. You feel protected. Now, if you're a bank robber and a drug dealer and a pimp, you see the policeman, you get nervous. The law was made for you. When the Bible says it wasn't made for a righteous man, it doesn't mean a righteous man does not obey the law. It simply means the law is not a condemnation to a righteous man because his life is consistent with the law of God. A town where everyone is law-abiding does not need policemen. <laughs> you don't agree with me? <laughs> Listen to me again. A town where everyone is law-abiding, does not need policemen. If you need... Oh, where's that? <laughs> it's coming. It's the new Jerusalem. <laughs> but let me finish. You need policemen in that town because people come into that town and cause trouble. Are you following me? But if you can keep them out, law-abiding people only need the Ten Commandments. Now, the law was not made for a righteous man because he's... Obedient to the law. But for the lawless, let's go over the list again, and disobedient. Say it with me. For the ungodly and for sinners. For unholy and profane. For murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers. For men stealers. Verse 10. For homemongers. For them that defile themselves with mankind. For men stealers. For liars. For perjured persons. Now that's the list. Now, I want you to look at every item on that list and tell me which one is good. Which one pleases God? Not one. Now, keep this in mind. Let's look at a similar list as we continue. What is sound doctrine? Go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Our subject, what is sound doctrine? 29 minutes after 6. Did I ask you if you had a good day today? Did you have a good day? All right. Okay, thank God for that. Always thank God. If you fall and break your leg, thank God you didn't break both. Are you following me? Always find a reason to thank God. Are you with me? And there always is. I wasn't being funny. There always is a reason to thank God. If you're in a trial that you didn't bring on yourself, thank God. Because trials are used by God to perfect people. All right. Galatians 5, we read from verse 19. Let me pray again. Holy Father in heaven, help me to move a little more slowly so my friends and your people get the message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Read with me. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Come on, say the list. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, Strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Finish that verse. Of the which I have told you, 
before, as I've also told you in times past, come on, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, go to verse 22 and 23, read with me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Finish verse 23. Against such there is no law. Now, you must think with me now. Concentrate. We read in uh, 1 Timothy 1 verse 9. But the law was, was not made for a righteous man. Because a righteous man does what's right. There's no law to condemn him. Now, we just read in Galatians 5, 22, 23, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Against such, there's no law. There's no law against a man who loves or a woman who loves, who's joyful, peaceful, long-suffering, temperate. There's no law against that. There's a law against, verse 19 to 21, adultery, fornication, and you know the long list. Now we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. There's a law against the unlawful, the disobedient, the ungodly, the sinners, and the lawless, and disobedient, the ungodly, the, the sinner, the profane, the unholy, you know, the murders of fathers, murders of mothers, the men stealers, the homongers, those that defile themselves as mankind, the men stealers, the liars, the perjured persons. There is a law against all of that. Because all of that is unlawful. Now, let's finish verse 10. And if there be, Come on. Any other thing, keep reading, that is contrary. Only my brother's reading, all right. God bless you for being so stubborn. Okay. If there be any other thing, question for you, any other thing beside what? What? Ah, sister, God bless you. What's already listed in 9 and 10? Are you with me? Name some of the things listed in nine. Come on, look at the Bible and tell me. Huh? Ungodly? Disobedient? Profane? Murderers of fathers? Murderers of mothers? What else? Manslayers? Come on. Next verse, ten. Homongers? Those that defy themselves with mankind? Go on. Men stealers? Mm -hmm. Liars? Perjured persons? That's the list. And Paul said, now, if there's any other thing beside all of that. In other words, anything else you can add to that hellish list. But notice how the verse ends. Which is what? Come on, 10. Finish 10. That is contrary. to sound. What's our subject? Come on, what's our subject? What is sound doctrine? Now, all those items listed in 9 and 10 are contrary to sound doctrine. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Now, I want you to give me one word for each one of them. Sin. Uh, sister, you're fast. God bless you. Sin. Now, sin is contrary. Finish my words. Think of the title. Think of the title. Come on. Think. Sin is contrary to sound doctrine. Are you with me? You may get a little headache, but you stay with me and the headache will go. Lawless, contrary to sound doctrine. Disobedient, contrary to sound doctrine. Ungodly, contrary to sound doctrine. Uh, unholy, profane, unholy, contrary to sound doctrine. Manslayers, contrary to sound doctrine. Murders of fathers, murders of mothers, contrary to sound doctrine. Homongers, contrary to sound doctrine. Um, liars, perjured persons, contrary to sound doctrine. Defilers of themselves with mankind, contrary to sound doctrine, which means sin is contrary to sound Bible teaching. Is that clear? Now, what is sin? What is the Bible definition of sin? The transgression of the... You must never hesitate on this question. Sin is the transgression of the law. 
First John chapter 3, verse 4. He that committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. The Bible says, where there's no law, there's no transgression. Are you with me? Let me tell you again, sin is the transgression of the law. All those things we read in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, they are all what? Transgression, come on, of the law. Which means anything that transgresses God's law is contrary to sound doctrine. Which means any teaching someone brings you that lowers God's law is dangerous. Now, some people do that very cleverly. They highlight love. <laughs> now, who can argue with love? Are you following me? Love, 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 love. I love love. We all love love. But what did Jesus say about love? Come on. If you love me, come on, talk to me. Keep my commandments. This is love that you walk after my commandments. Second... Uh, 2 John verse 6. This is love that you walk after my commandments. If you love me, it is impossible to fully talk about love and exclude the commandments of God. Because that's how we express love. Are you following me? By obeying God. Without obedience to God, love is impossible. You cannot express love to God outside of obedience to God's law. And so the Bible says sin is contrary to sound doctrine, meaning anything that goes against the law of God is contrary to sound doctrine. Anyone who weakens God's law puts your eternal life in danger. What is sound doctrine? Anything that upholds the law of God. Are you with me? Let me pray again. I'll put something else at your, on your, at your, in, to your attention. Fathers, I continue. Be with me, please, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31, we'll read verse 33. Our subject, what is sound doctrine? Jeremiah 31, reading verse 33. You're familiar with this verse. It's also used in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10 and Hebrews 10 verse 16. Are you there? Jeremiah 31. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will do what? Put my law where? In the inward parts and? And write it in their hearts. Yes. I will put my law. In the inward parts and write it where? In their hearts. In the mind and the heart. You see, at one point I thought the mind and the heart were the same thing. They're not. The mind understands intellectually what the law says. The heart loves it and is willing to obey it. Are you following me? Amen. When you preach, Ellen White says, reach the head and the heart. If you only reach the head, your work is not done. If you only reach this, you get an emotional response with no understanding. Christ appeals to both. He puts the law here and he puts the law here. You understand it and you love it. A lot of people understand the seventh day of the Sabbath, but they don't like it. They understand it here, but they don't like it. God puts the law here and he puts the law here. Now, stay with me. Let's read that verse again. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, now you read, I will put my law where? In the inward parts and write it in their hearts. Now, question for you, what else does God write in the heart and the inward parts? Think with me, this is a quiz. You have 10 seconds to answer. What else does God write according to the verse? I'll keep you until 9 o'clock if you don't answer me. <laughs> Not really. Come on. Think. Look at the verse. I'm not giving you the answer. You have to give it to me. What does the verse say God puts into the heart and the inward parts? What does he put? The 
The law. Do you see that? Yes or no? Yes. Mm. Now, my question to you is, according to that verse, what else does he put into the heart and the inward parts beside the law? Nothing. nothing. Whoever said nothing, God bless you. Did you say nothing? Well, don't tell me. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> this is critical. He does not write anything else. He just writes the law. Here. Now, where else? Here. You understand it, and you obey it. He writes nothing else. Say it again. Well, yeah, it happens here. It doesn't happen here. It happens here. The understanding happens here. The humility to obey happens here. Oh, how love I thy law, says David in Psalm 119, verse 97. That comes out of here. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. Are you with me? All he puts is the law. Which means, all he wants is what? Obedience. But he wants obedience not only from here. He wants it from here. So that we love to obey. Are you following me? Obedience becomes a joy. Because what we understand, we love. A lot of people understand that hard work will get you a salary, but they don't like the work they do. So they go to work miserable every Monday. And can't wait to get home on Friday. You're just miserable to death. But they understand, I need this to get paid, but the heart is not in it. God puts his law in the mind and in the heart of the believer who surrenders to him. He writes nothing else. What am I trying to tell you? Let's go to Romans chapter 8. For someone who's about to tell me you're preaching legalism, salvation by works. Absolutely not. Let's go to Romans 8. Let's read from verse 1. Our subject is, what is sound doctrine? And you tell me, what is sound doctrine? Any doctrine that is consistent with, come on, the law of God or the Ten Commandments. Any doctrine that supports the Ten Commandments is a sound doctrine. Do you have Romans 8? Reading from verse 1. Not yet. It's 19 minutes to 7. Alright, let's read together. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, what do you understand by the word walk? Live, yes. Who live not according to the flesh, but the spirit. Keep reading. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. And I told you, the law cannot save you. Are you with me? Jesus saves you and the law witnesses to the fact that you are changed. Your life is righteous. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Condemn sin where? In the flesh. Meaning we don't have to sin. Christ showed us that. That the righteousness of the law. Finish the verse. Might be fulfilled where? In us. Why? Because that's where God put it. The righteousness of the law is not fulfilled in the word. By having it on a shelf. That's what I mean. The righteousness of the law is not fulfilled by having all of Eloi's books. The righteousness of the law is fulfilled where? In us. Here and here. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The law is the very righteousness of God. That's why Romans tells us the righteousness of the law. When you observe the seventh-day Sabbath, that is an act of righteousness done by the power of Christ. When you refuse to steal, that is an expression of righteousness. When you, refuse, when you honor your parents, that is an expression of righteousness. When you refuse to bear false witness, that is an expression of righteousness. The righteousness of the law, all ten, not the ceremonial law. The Ten Commandments. They express righteousness. Psalm 119, verse 172 my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Go to Isaiah 51, let's read verse 7. 
Isaiah 51, verse 7, our subject, what is sound doctrine? And you tell me again, what is sound doctrine? Come on, what is sound doctrine? Any doctrine <laughs> that upholds, come on, the law of God. Mm -hmm. And any doctrine that weakens the law of God, avoid it. What book did I say? Isaiah. What chapter? 51. What verse? 7. Now you can put a smile on my face if you read with me at least once. You know, we're, we're, time is flying. We've finished on Sabbath. All right. Are you there? Read with me. Hearken unto me. What? Ah, ye that know you have a personal experience with righteousness. Read the next statement. The people in whose heart, come on, is my law. Now, the only way to know righteousness by experience is to have what? The law of God written on the heart and the mind. The heart, the inward parts. The mind, the heart. You understand it, you love it, you obey it. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose law, in my whose heart, is my law. Now, God writes the law on our hearts, our minds. How does he do that? Let's make two observations first. It is not I who writes the law, who write the law on my heart. Because I can't do it. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The last thing my carnal nature wants is to have the law written in my heart. Understand me clearly. You and I are born hating the law of God, which is the same thing as hating God. We are born that way. No one is born loving God or loving the Bible, spiritual things. We're born hating. That's why the Bible says, when we were enemies, huh? we were exiled to God by the death of his son. While we were enemies, while we were ungodly, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the weak. Christ died for enemies, not people who loved him. Are you following me? All right. What book did I send you to? Isaiah 51, verse 7. Read that again. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose law, in whose heart is my law. And I told you, you and I cannot write it. That's why God has to write it. Are you with me? Let me say it again. A sinner has no interest in God's law. It is the conviction of the Spirit that brings that man or that woman to surrender and allows God to do the writing. Now, here's how God writes it. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Here's how God writes it. That law that is the judge of whether a doctrine is sound or not. It is the law of God that makes that determination. Do you have uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3? We read verse 3. Are you there for as much as you have been manifestly declared to be what? The epistles of Christ ministered by us. Not? Written not? Stop. Written not with ink. Now keep reading. But with the spirit, come on, of the living God. Now stop. Who does the writing according to that verse so far? The spirit of God. Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Now, we know who does the writing. Notice where he writes. Keep reading. Not in... Uh-huh. Now, when you hear tables of stone, where does your mind go? The Ten Commandments on Sinai. That's where they were written. Now, Paul is saying, when a person comes to Christ, the law is not written on stone. Is written where? On the tables of the heart. By the same power that wrote it on the... It was the Holy Spirit that wrote it on the stones. The Bible shows that very clearly. That same spirit that wrote the law called the finger of God on stone writes it not on stony hearts but on fleshy. Meaning, why do you understand? Why does he say fleshy as opposed to stone? All right? Think of a stony heart and a fleshy heart. What's the difference? One is hard. Give me another word for hard in respect to the law. Long word. D-I-S-O. Disobedient. 
Now think of a fleshy heart. It means it's nice and soft and malleable. What, give me a word for that. Obedient. God writes his law on our hearts, our minds. The agency that writes is the spirit of God. And the Bible is clear. Not on tables of stone as happened at Sinai, but on fleshy tables of the heart. Now, go to Matthew chapter 12. Let's read verse 34. Of Matthew 12, we'll read from 34 our subject, What is Sound Doctrine? I hope my online friends are still with us. Matthew 12, let's read from verse 34. Father in heaven, continue to be with me in the person of your spirit of truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Matthew 12, reading from verse 34, when you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me, what does that say? Oh, generation of vipers, read carefully now. How can ye, being evil, speak good things? Stop. An evil person cannot do what? It's right in the verse. An evil person cannot do what? Speak good things. How can ye being evil speak good things? Why is that the case? Finish the verse. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What comes out of your mouth originates where? Uh-huh. Now, let's read the next verse, 35. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. Spot. Stop. But what does God write on the heart of a good man or woman? His law. And that's it. When the law of God is truly written on the heart and the mind, what comes out pleases God. And so Jesus says, a good man. Now we know the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. So that goodness is the presence of the Spirit of God in His law. There's none good, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. We read that in Psalm 14, and we read that in uh, Romans chapter 3. No one naturally does good. We cannot do it. It must be done through us with our permission. And so Jesus says, a good man, you can only be made good by God, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth what? Good fruit. Can't do it. That's why someone who has rejected Christ, that person may give a million dollars to the Salvation Army and two million to the Red Cross. And three million to doctors without borders. And in the eyes of God, all of that is sin. Because it came from a kind of a heart. A sinful heart where the law of God does not exist. That's why Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Is that good? Yes or no? Mm-hmm. And in thy name have cast out devils. That's good. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. How does that verse end? Ye that work iniquity. What's iniquity about casting out devils? And doing many good works. And prophesying? The source from which it came and the motive behind it. Ellen White says every act is judged by the motive. Came out of an evil heart, so God calls it works of iniquity. Now when the heart is converted and it is filled with the law of God, what comes out, Jesus calls, good. But for many of us, the law of God exists only here. It does not exist here. God wants to write it both places. Here, you understand? Now do it. Don't do it grudgingly. Do it gladly. The Bible predicts of Jesus Christ, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. That's a prophecy of Jesus. 
That's why we tell people, put your heart into it. Do it with all your heart and soul. Let it come from here. Yes, we understand it, but you're not in it. It's not part of you until it's in your heart. What is sound doctrine? Any doctrine that is consistent with the law of God. Let me tell you something else about the law of God. This is not legalism. This is merely talking about the lifestyle God requires. The Bible says in Romans 7.10, The commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. What is he saying? The purpose of the law is to preserve life. All the commandments which I command thee this day, shall ye observe to do, that ye may live. Deuteronomy 8 verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day, shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply. Obedience is life. Yes, the law is not an instrument of salvation. Only Christ can save. But when Christ saves you, he sends you to the law, that the law may say, yes, that's the life that I'm looking for. And so Paul says, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, anything that weakens the law of God is dangerous doctrine. You're familiar with Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20? To the law and to the testimony, come on, finish it. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light. Let me tell you this, and I'll stop. If you want to judge the accuracy of a teaching, Look at it in the light of the law of God. That's the test. That's the standard that must test every doctrine, every theory, every profession, the law of God. Why? Because the law of God is the whole duty of man. That is all God requires. Now, God's law is broad. Psalm 119, verse 96, I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Very broad. Each one of the ten is so deep, you and I can never fully understand. By reading commandment 6, thou shalt not kill, all of us may say, well, I've never killed, so I've never broken that one. When you understand how Jesus clarified that on the Sermon on the Mount, Anger is murder. Hatred is murder. Then you understand God's law judges my intentions. It's not just behavior. Behavior has a source. That's this. So Jesus didn't die to change your fist. He died to change this. And this. Not a fist. Because what the fist does comes from here. And so my brothers and sisters, let me make a recommendation to you. Ask God to write or rewrite his law where? On your heart. Come on, and in the mind. With the mind, you do what? You understand it. With the heart, you obey it joyfully. Not grudgingly, joyfully. As David said, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119 verse uh, 97. In Psalm 119, verse 20, he says, My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. He said, I'm yearning for the judgment of your laws. He just loved the law of God. Listen to this quotation. The man who attempts to, to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. Now, let's look at people in prison. They don't obey. They comply. <laughs> Are you following me? They comply because they know <laughs> the warden may extend my stay in that hotel. They comply. They do not obey. The child of God should obey, but too many Christians just comply. We must obey. Obey is total life involvement. Compliance is the letter of the law. Obedience is the spirit of the law. And so when you comply, you say, I have never killed anyone physically. I have complied. But you have not obeyed because you're angry with somebody. Prisoners comply. They don't obey. 
The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey when the requirements of God are considered or counted a burden because they cut across human inclination. We may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all loyalty, of all righteousness, sorry, is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right. That's how God wants us to live. Is it right? I do it. Not is it profitable. I'll keep the Sabbath even though that's my biggest business day because it's the right thing to do. Are you following me? We must ask, is it right? Is it lawful? Is it biblical? If you take that approach, people will stop observing Sundays as Sabbath because it's not biblical. What is sound doctrine? Come on. <laughs> okay, hold on. This side, what is sound doctrine? Anything that's consistent with God's law. That side, are they right? Yes, they are right. How many of you now will say, Lord, write or rewrite your law on my heart and my mind? Can I see your hand? Do you really mean that? Stand up, stand up with us. Stand, stand. Don't miss tomorrow night. I already have the message. That's not usually the case, but I think God has given me the message for tomorrow night. Don't miss it tomorrow night, Wednesday night prayer meeting. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Ah, Lord, we thank you. It's straightforward, Father, really, if we read it honestly. We thank you for this tremendous act of grace. This act of grace is the fact you're willing to write the law on our hearts, something we cannot do and do not want to do. We tend to put a barrier between law and grace, but Father, help us to see that next to giving of Christ on Calvary, writing the law in our hearts is a tremendous act of grace. Because in so doing, you're doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And if that law is not written, no one can be saved. The giving of the law is an act of grace. We thank you for it. Dear God, with every day that passes, help us to love right doing. Just love it. Let's do right regardless of consequence because that's the way you are. That's the way Jesus was and is. That's the way the Spirit of God is. And that's the way those giants of the Bible were, men and women. And so God put into our hearts love for the law, put into our minds understanding of that law, that having understood it, we'll do it lovingly. Let us shun disobedience, dear God, like the plague. Now bless all those who heard. Take us home safely. Bring us back tomorrow night for the message I believe you've given to me. I pray in Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. You may be seated.